Hi, it's Matt McLaughlin with a special invitation. If you'd like to join me and my team of outstanding historians to walk the ground where these videos were made, visit our website and join one of our Battlefield tours. That's battlefields.com.au. Enjoy the video. Simon, we're here in Poparinga, which was a town behind the lines, and it wasn't just a place for soldiers to come and get out of the firing line, but there was a place of genuine respite for them behind the lines, an every man's club. Yes. Tell us about Talbot House and why it's here. Yes. Well, Poparinga, or Pops as they called it a hundred years ago, was uh, first stop behind hell, home to a quarter of a million soldiers uh, who also came here for their free time. R and R, and uh, as you can imagine, that you know there were some issues with that, and uh, to uh, support the people, support them also with their mental health, uh, the British Partners uh, took matters in their own hand and opened their own club, uh, a respite, a home from home, basically, and uh, the the guy leading that effort was known as Philip Clayton, but is, well, everyone knows his nickname, Tubby. So Tubby is the man who uh, founded the club, who gave its its ID. Uh, of an every man's club. So the famous town of Ypres, Ypres yes. is just down the road, which was completely destroyed during the war. But you said this was behind the line. So is a lot of what we see around us original from before the war? So Popperinger got bombed as well, but not as much as, as other towns. Ypres, you know, was annihilated. Um, Popperinger was damaged, but uh, survived. And uh, some of the local people stayed behind to open shops, you know, uh, run cinemas, you know. Uh, so for both sides, it was a huge shock, you know. The local people had never seen the Chinese Labour Corps, for instance, before. Imagine Chinese New Year with uh, 12,000 Chinese, uh, you know, labourers with dragons and fireworks. It was, uh, was a shock to people. Uh, they printed photos, postcards of the Sikh soldiers in town, you know. Uh, that was so exotic, they just produced it on postcard. Uh, so, um, yeah, and the, the beautiful thing, the link with Talbot House, is that the local children uh, were invited by the British and Australian and by the other soldiers to come in and celebrate uh, Christmas, for instance, with them. So uh, it was a beautiful gesture, really, of how the two communities were well, all, all merged together, really. Yeah. Well, I can imagine that during the war, this was a pretty bustling area, a pretty bustling town. A little bit quieter today, but it's a fascinating story, Talbot House. Should we go inside and, and talk yeah, a little yeah. bit more about it? Welcome home. I must admit this is not my first time here, I've been here a few times, but every time I come, Simon, I just love the personal touches, the personal connection with Tubby Clayton. I mean, it feels like his ghost is walking beside you in every room. Tell us some of the fascinating things that you've preserved so that Tubby's memory is not forgotten. Yeah, so uh, he said from day one, my house, my rules. So it's in every man's club. Uh, as the sign still reads today, it means everyone walking through the door is treated equally. And actually, we're standing next to a beautiful aquarelle telling that story. So, uh, one day we have um, Tubby dressed in rags, a padre shouldn't do that, cleaning, mopping the floor, and his Batman comes and finds him, uh, because General Plumer, uh, in charge of the Second Army, has walked through the door. So Tubby races down, General's not, you know, here on a, he's on a visit, He's actually a chauffeur that day because he's picked up a wandering Australian sergeant who was lost in the fields and he gave him a ride to Talbot House, you know, and told Tubby, look after him, treat him as my guest, you know, uh, everything okay? Good night. And he walked off again. Uh, general, uh, the general taking time out of his busy day, you know, to look out for an Australian sergeant. That's Talbot House, you know, every man's club. That's extraordinary. And it was unusual, wasn't it? Because this was a very hierarchical system. This was the British Army. We had a very important class system, which was, which was reflected in officers at the top and privates at the bottom. It must have been highly unusual to have a building like this one, where every man could abandon his rank when he walked in the door. It was unique. Uh, there's no other like it, uh, certainly. Um, 
it is uh, it was only made possible through the ideas of Tubby himself and then he had a lot of support with senior officers as well going as far as the Prince of Wales uh, who backed him up uh, General Plumer was a great fan of the whole idea as well so any problems you pick up the phone <laughs> ring, ring the General's HQ and they'll sort it out you know uh, but uh, he convinced people really he, he had to ask for help not, not a lot he he convinced people by, by the, his magnetic personality. And uh, that's really what kept him going as well, and kept everyone else going. He inspired half a million visitors, you know. And uh, still this afternoon, I have an email from a lady saying how she remembers meeting Tevi in the 1960s, you know, of, uh, when he was a very old man, and he still had that energy inside him, that fire that wouldn't rest, you know. Um, yeah. Well, we can see that personality reflected because the signs, the famous Tubby Clay Clayton signs, there's one just here, to pessimists, way out, pointing to the front door. I mean, I just love that. They're in the, they're in the battlefields of Flanders, the hell on yeah, earth, yes, literal yes, hell yes. on earth. And he's saying to pessimists, you know, this way out, keep a smile on your face. I yes. mean, it's just, yes. it just shows a reflection yes. of the man and the joy and, yes. and what he was trying to do for the soldiers. Yes. And, and it's so powerful that that one sign still sums up the mentality of the house, the volunteers, the staff, you know, today. Uh, even in COVID, you know, no one wanted to back down. Let, let's keep going, you know, uh, and there will always be blue skies ahead, you know, uh, don't worry. And there's others like it, you know, um, don't judge a man by his umbrella. It may not be his. Um, if you're in the habit of spitting on the carpet at home, please spit here. Uh, be reasonable. Do it my way. You know, there's, there's, uh, yeah, there's a million of his sayings that, that, that live on in, in the house today. Uh, and we try and, you know, uh, live by them. Uh, well, I can, I can see them preserved on the walls. But there's something over here that I wanted to point out as well, which is one of my favourite things I think I've seen on the battlefields, this map. Tell us about this map and why it's significant. People came through. First question you ask is, where are you from? Uh, you meet new people and you want to point out, you know, where you're from. And there were maps here of London, Australia, Canada on the wall. Uh, one of the maps is left today. This is a map of the local area. And people came in and they pointed out, you know, where they had been. Uh, sadly, or luckily, <laughs> an awful lot of them didn't wash enough. So the muddy fingerprints are preserved. And you can make out the Ypres sailing, for instance, on the map, Passchendaele. Uh, Eper itself, Messines, and, and Popperinger is completely covered under the mud. Uh, and this, this is a tragic map because every fingerprint is, uh, is a story. I went over the top there, that's where I lost him, that's where I buried him. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's a very telling document, this one. I think the part of it that speaks most to me is this curve here, as you said, the salient. This is the front line. And thousands of muddy fingers having just come in from the trenches have traced as you say the front line or here's where we were we advanced in this direction as you say here's where I buried my mate and it's just frozen in time what an extraordinary document this is yes yeah we're very lucky it survived and uh, we know there were plenty more of it off home which would have told a different story a more happier story because this, this is also unique to us in the fact that it is a, a document that talks about the war. There were very few of those. The war was hardly ever mentioned, Toby said. Uh, you could hear the sound of the guns. You know, everyone was in khaki, speaking a military language, but the topics were non-military. So this map is really unique in that. Uh, if you ask me personally, I think I would have rather have seen the London or the Australian map survive than, than the war-torn one, because this is, talks about tragedies real tragedies, the Talbot House is, is the remedy for that, is the, well, the, you know, the, the antidote, if you like, uh, the brief respite you get, yeah. But uh, sadly, it's the only one left in the collection today, yeah. When soldiers were here, Simon, I understand that on that map over on the wall, they're talking about where they'd been on the battlefields and, and what they'd done. But of course, the other thing when they'd come here is they'd want to catch up with their mates. Yeah. And yes. that's what this document tells the story of, isn't it? Explain a little bit about this really important and really moving document. Talbot House is a house of friendship. It's a house of people. You want to trace them, so you leave messages. There were you know, a quarter of a million men in town, women as well, so trying to find the one individual was hard. So you came in, you left a note for Gunnar Villiers, and someone walked in and said, ah, I know the guy, he died in action. Or... Uh, He's looking for his friend or his brother. Well, he's wounded. So it's a document that could help you uh, 
uh, trace family members and it, it worked uh, because even I remember in my younger years meeting veterans here uh, that would tap me on the shoulder and say move you know I was here before you lad this is the spot where I met my brother this you know at this table he wanted to sit there to remember his brother who died a few weeks later you know uh, at one point so he had a guy arrested uh, so he could come and meet his brother. Uh, imagine, you know, the lengths he went through. It's it's just, but yeah. what a document. I mean, the thing that always strikes me about studying this history is finding those personal connections. That's what brings the history to life. And there's nothing more personal than this. People leaving their names. And, you know, in Blighty, someone's written in pencil here. So in Blighty, back to England. That's good. So, yeah. this per so, so this gun has gone back to England. So that would have been a great relief for his mates. Other ones here wounded. Okay, he might be the field hospital. There are a lot of hospitals mm -hmm. on the outskirts of town. But then this one, heartbreaking, died in action. Yes, imagine yes. coming, imagine you were the bloke that left that note and then you came back the next time you are in here and you saw that someone had left that again. Just heartbreaking grief, the, the pencil marks, yeah. friends, please write. Yeah. It's, just, it's, just, it's just, I mean, I get shivers just thinking of the men standing here. And it's, it's that desperate human connection, isn't yes, it? Yes. That in, it? For all the bravado and I'm yes. gonna take on the Germans single-handedly, they just wanna catch up with their mate or their brother. It's, it's extraordinary. It was, uh, yeah. They, they wanted to reach out again, you know, they wanted to feel human again and they missed their friends, their relatives and uh, they were, l friends please write, he's lonely, he has hundreds of soldiers around but he wants to find those mates again. And you uh, made a good point about this Simon, you said this was the equivalent of Facebook yes. back during yeah, the First yeah, World War, yeah, yes. literally writing on someone's wall. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so they, they this is the typed out version, they had a lot, it was, there was graffiti on the walls as well I imagine, so they, they had a Scottish uh, soldier typing it out overnight I imagine, uh, and there, this is the only part that survived, there would have been thousands of names. It's glorious how well it's been preserved, you really do feel like you're travelling back uh, in time. We've got the painting of Tubby Clayton here over the fireplace. Just tell us a little bit about, about the man. He was quite a character. Tell us a little bit more about Tubby Clayton. He was, uh, the least you can say, he was a real character. Uh, he was uh, born in Australia, lived there only for a year or two, moved to England, uh, had his calling, and uh, he was 29, only 29 when he came up here uh, with the task of opening this new every well this new soldiers club which ended up being the first every man's club uh, he was although he was a chaplain with the forces he's the least military man you can imagine he hardly ever was in uniform would wear two different colors of socks you know um, and the one thing is that really is typical of him is his pipe he puffed on his pipe continuously but also forgot to extinguish it so he ended up smoking like a chimney um, he, he got in all sorts of trouble with, you can imagine, with the military, but always managed to talk his way out of it. Um, you know, and he's, you know, you know uh, speak to God, you know, is, uh, you know <laughs> that, that's the true boss. Uh, but he had a magnetic personality, and that's really what, what opened him, well, opened all the doors for him, what uh, gave him the opportunity to, to run a house like this. Uh, till his dying a day, he would inspire people. Um, with, his, with very small gestures of kindness, you know, uh, he had a real, he had a very good way with the with the common soldier, but he could chat up the general just as well, you know, and that that was quite rare, you know, uh, for a simple chaplain of 29 years old, you know. These chaplains, the army chaplains, we hear a lot about them. We read stirring accounts about them rescuing wounded and providing solace to men in their darkest hours, but we both have met modern chaplains as well, and they're, they're of the same breed, aren't they? Well, what is it about army chaplains? They're just such an essential part of the fabric of the military. They are part of the military hierarchy, the hierarchy but uh, in a way, they're really much outside that. You know, they are their own people with their own agendas, very much, uh, with their own goals in life, and they care deeply, deeply about their men um, and want to provide the best possible care for them. And uh, they, they tend to have a far better picture of what the men are, are about to face than often the men themselves. So they pre try and prepare them for what is to come. Uh, and that is not an easy feat, you know. It's, you know even in peacetime, how, how do you keep the men focused, you know? Uh, and uh, I still today I hear a lot of people uh, proclaiming what an influence the, the chaplains have on, on the common soldier. So, um, yeah, they're a, they're a special breed. From your time here, Simon, and from knowing about Tubby Clayton, 
he was a religious man, this was a religious institution. How much of the come on in and put your boots on the table was, was designed to bring men closer to God? Uh, there's certainly that. Oh, interesting. Uh, there's certainly that as well, you know. Uh, so every day, several times a day, the gongs would go. We'll have a look in a minute. And uh, Toby would invite you to go up to Mass. Uh, you were certainly not obligated. Uh, he wouldn't pressure you. But um, he, his personality uh, and the camaraderie as well, the band of brothers, would lure you up, you know. Uh, mass is all about singing hymns for Toby. And it brings you together, it knits one tight, you know, and, and that helped as well. So there, there was a bit of both, you know, and there's certainly, a, the chapel is again open to all denominations, uh, but uh, there's certainly the, the Christian values are an essential part of, of what he did in the house, the kindness he showed, you know, the charity as well. So, uh, but again, you find it in all sorts of religions. But uh, he got his strength through God, he always proclaimed. So he really was a man of God. Well, he put that energy into making this, uh, uh, as we said, a respite for the men. Tell us a little bit more about the house. What, this room, for example, what was this used for during the war? So everything in the house moved around. So we have photographs of this very room being a library, also being Toby's office, uh, his private study. Uh, and uh, we've now dressed it as the lounge, let's say, the reception room. Uh, where men would come in, you know, it was an every man's club, so uh, in here you could have your cup of tea, uh, you could meet friends, to, um, you know, uh, reacquaint yourself with people, uh, read newspapers, why not, you know, uh, relax, uh, sing songs. Uh, the ground floor really here is the realm of the body, so everything we have here on the ground floor is, is, for, is for loud, noisy, gaiety and entertainment, he used to say. So. Um, Shall we explore and uh, have a look? Yeah, keep showing yeah, us yeah, around. Yeah. It's a fantastic place. So uh, in the middle room here, again, you know, the function of it differed. They had uh, at one point a shop with a Merry Christmas atmosphere all year round. <laughs> with two price lists, depending on, you know, if you were uh, a wealthy officer or a poor Australian private, you know, you, you'd pay differently. Uh, also, uh, as the photograph on the door shows, there used to be at some point be an English billiard table. Uh, not, not a European cannonball game, to be said. Uh, a real English billiard table. They, they just managed to cram into this room. The only problem was with the chalk. You know, there wasn't any, so that, well, you, you put a cue in the ceiling, you know, until that came falling down, you know. Uh, so, um, yeah, that, that was the function of this room. And let's have a look in the old uh, dining room in the canteen now, perhaps. It's uh, through here. So, um, this was uh, used as a kind of a dining room for the private family before the war started. But as soon as Toby got hold of it, as the, the photographs behind us show, it was a canteen uh, where you had your cocoa, your tea, uh, your, your sandwiches, and uh, yeah, lots of benches, you know, and, and, and a handful of comfortable chairs where they took turns in sitting on, because they weren't used sitting on chairs anymore, apparently. And, uh, and pianos. We know at one point they had four different pianos on the estate, imagine. Really? Uh, not come by honestly. Uh, again, lots of stories on how he uh, acquired those, you know. Um, and one of the pianos uh, decided to stay. It's still with us today. And Toby said it's so used to the constant strumming that if you ask it gently uh, by 1918, it could play a little grey home in the West without any further action on your part. <laughs> it's so used to the constant beating it's had. Uh, and still with us today, you know, uh, we keep having it restored. And uh, heritage people will then go, Jesus, you know, you ought to seal that off. And we say, no, Toby wanted to play, please play today. And anyone who comes in, literally anyone who can play piano, we get in front of that instrument and, and they uh, tickle the ivories. Well, I, I can't play, but it would be <laughs> remiss of me not to put my hands where thousands of soldiers have. So, I mean. It's amazing. Yeah. It's living history. Yeah, it's living history. And that, that's, that's the essence of Talbot House, you know. It is a living museum. We are a licensed museum and all that, but it is, to us, it's home. It's a club. It still needs to serve that purpose today. And uh, they, well, Tubby, for instance, and his mates have highly spoke against glass cases even. 
don't seal everything off, you know, use it, you know. Uh, some of these chairs, uh, we found dates on the side of them saying 1915. I doubt they would have been the same as here, but it's all, these tables date from 1929, for instance. Uh, and we use them day in, day out, why not, you know. Uh, it's what the house is about, you know. Uh, and long may it continue, we always say. Simon, we talk about soldiers finding solace in Talbot House from the horrors of the battlefield and I think the, the garden sums that up better than anything else. I mean, this must have been an incredible place of refuge for the soldiers who've just come from the mud and the, the, the stench of the trenches. True. Toby used to say, come into the garden and forget about the war. And you couldn't forget, you could hear the noise of the guns nearby, but between that you could hear birdsong and it, you know, made one think of home. Someone wrote back, uh, there's unbelievable green grass, you know, uh, you could play ping pong and tennis in the garden. There was a veggie patch. Uh, and if you weren't feeling on the top of your game, let's say, Toby said, actually, I need a garden this week. Could you cut the lawn, you know, the coming days? And, you know, there's, uh, there's, you know, there's garden games still today. There's, uh, yeah, it, it's still the same refuge, if you like. Uh, it's... Uh, special place where you can still feel them you know some of these the, the garden is still laid out the way it would have been so some of the trees are original ones still um, it is a it's a yeah it's a it's a very special place you can still feel it you can still touch it do you feel that when you're in the house when you're in the garden do you feel the ghosts of the boys around you <laughs> yes yes but well one of our volunteers uh, Trump's all that. Uh, Martin has been coming for 30 years. He gets up in the morning. We go to Tubby and talk to him in his room. I trim the roses and put him in his in, in, in Tubby's room. You know, uh, as as uh, as a tribute. And uh, they've never gone home. He says they are still here. And in a way that is true. The 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 volunteers of today are are the living successors. And and it gets passed on. And yes, in a way you. Like in COVID, I sat here all alone those days, and you're never completely alone uh, because you know a lot of people care also about the house. You always feel a certain presence, you know, and I've never seen anyone else wandering around, uh, if you ask, but uh, a lot of our volunteers have, you know, uh, have come across General Plumer. He's one of the regular ones, or Arthur Pettifer, Tubby Clayton, you know, um, but yeah, it. Uh, there's something comforting in that. In it a strange is. Way. It is. And, and that, no, no one's ever worried. worried you know? I'm not. I'm not spiritual. I don't necessarily believe in ghosts. But the thought that you might run into a soldier yeah. strolling the grounds is, is is quite comforting. And the people who have were never worried. You know, they they. It was very comforting. They said as well. It is. It is. What you'd expect almost. Uh, and the other thing we do, we have a lot is people are recognizing uh, relatives on photographs. You know, who who almost want to believe that he came through. Uh, a lot of. Pilgrims today really desperately almost hope that their relative came through, that they at least had this before they died. Yes. Welcome to the upper room. Wow, it's a pretty special place. It's the, the shrine of the Ypres salient, as we used to say, with thousands of men walking the steps before you, having their first or perhaps their last Holy Communion here. It's a, it's a sacred location, he said, a sacred place. I um, You can't help but think when you're in a place like this just about the men who were here before you. And it, it would have been, meant so much to them to have that last service, that last communion before heading off into the killing fields. And you know, many of them never to return. You asked before why, uh, if, if they, why they would come to Mass, was there a trick to get them up here? But <laughs> if you ask me, a lot of men uh, came here to find uh, an, a taste of home again, but at the same time they were trying to find the courage to go back and face it all again. And you look left and right of you, you know, Battle of Passion was announced to the men here in the garden, they knew the odds weren't good. So you come up here and for a brief moment you are hoping to, uh, to find the courage, you know, and, and have that togetherness, that band of brothers singing the hymns. And then very calmly, usually very quietly, they would leave here. And the one thing they did when leaving was thank Tubby. 
and he said that was absolutely beastly, them saying goodbye, uh, knowing that some would come back, you know, and uh, he kept names and, and the names are endless, you know, lists and lists of people, of friends that he made who would not come back and um, that's the other side of Talbot House, you know, and the reason that motivated him to keep doing it, you know, to try and, and at least uh, calm as many of them as possible and, 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 and provide that courage. Yeah. It's a very significant room in the house. Can you walk us around and tell us about a few of the items that are yeah. in here because there's some pretty special items yeah. in this place. It's again, uh, it starts all with having an upper room. The engineers would have preferred to call it, you know, a, a lower room, you know. Uh, they wanted to use the cellars and Toby said, no, God will look after us, don't you worry. Uh, and uh, just weeks before he said that, you know, a shell had landed upstairs in the attic here. Uh, so Toby wrote home to his mother that he named the room in, in honor of the German visitor, uh, 5.9, <laughs> the caliber of the shell. <laughs> so the wall would have been opened that side, the engineers came to fix it and, you know, Toby, well, just went along with the whole ID and he squeezed in by 1916 120 full grown men in this <laughs> tiny room. That's a lot of men in uh, a small uh, space. Yeah, 10 times a day sometimes they had to come between services with a tray of tea to supply the padre to keep him going, you know. Um, and what, what artifacts, you know, the, here is something very Australian just, just behind you, Matt. Um, dedicated to the Australian and Canadian tunnelers of Hill 60. Uh, uh, they needed light in the evenings, so they uh, cut up a four-poster bed <laughs> and uh, put candles on. Why not? Fantastic. Uh, a lot of these soldiers, especially you know the the people either from the bush, but also city industrial cities like Manchester, wouldn't have gone to church, uh, wouldn't have been on their list, you know, of things they were capable to do. Even for instance, uh, so a lot of hadn't been baptized. So. Everything around you vanishes, religion is a constant, so you cling to that and you get baptized, why not? So this comes from Australia. Tebby was baptized in this himself in Maryborough and his family brought it with them to England and mothers had it shipped out to Tebby to use it here. Um, so uh, yeah, that makes the third leg of the, the four poster bed. What happened to the fourth leg, we don't know. Uh, <laughs> the most, yeah, the, the, the real shrine, the tr th true sh shrine really is uh, the carpenter's bench, the altar. Uh, Joseph, Jesus were carpenters. Uh, if it is good enough for Jesus, it will do me nicely. It still has the rusty nails in it, so uh, it is the original carpenter's bench uh, that was used here. So, um, What um, about the cross on the, on the wall over here, a grave marker? We um, had uh, a very strong affiliation still do today with the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, the people who maintain the cemeteries. So when the chapel was rededicated after the war, after they purchased the house, the gardeners came up and every gardener offered as a, as a contribution, as a donation, a cross to an unknown British soldier. Oh, wow. uh, and these crosses were then divided up uh, over all the various Tokage Talbot houses worldwide. And many of them have come back today, so we have a huge collection of these crosses in our archives today. So, so um, it, it serves as a tribute to the missing Tolbotausians, in a way, the, the missing members of the club who uh, have not come back. So, um, yes. It's extraordinary. And that's why we have one of the new Commonwealth Reeds next to it. <laughs> it's fairly appropriate, I think. Uh, so, um, they helped us an awful lot over the years. Uh, in providing advice and so on, you know, we're two British organisations in, stuck in Belgium. <laughs> what other uh, fascinating artefacts? We, there's a, there's, is this some sort of organ yes, over the corner yes, over here? Yes, yes, um, So this is the uh, the groan box, if you like. <laughs> so we needed music. So one of the officers returned a week home early from leave. Imagine uh, bringing Major Street. His name was bringing a portable harmonium. So it collapses, it folds up and you take it you know, uh, with you wherever you want to go. Next thing you need is someone to play it, so why not um, we'll get the organist from the Royal Philharmonic you know, in London, you know? Uh, and it still does the trick, you know, you need to pump air through it and... Uh <laughs> wow, well, that is haunting, imagine that. Yeah. Imagine it, that echoing uh, out through this... Uh, through this chapel. Through this chapel, but also through the trenches. He took this in a side span of a motor car 
to advanced dressing stations at you know a transport farm or he went to Hellfire Corner and imagine sitting in a trench at night and suddenly hearing this <laughs> haunty music floating your way. You it's know? mournful, isn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, so um, you know he you know, military rule book really wasn't his thing. You know uh, <laughs> he took it with him. You know and it was hence it was always broken. Still today it continues to break down. We always have to get it restored. Uh, and um, Tubby had someone to fix it as well. His, we, know, we don't know his real name. His nickname was, and he was an officer, was Fatty. <laughs> so imagine <laughs> Fatty and Tubby <laughs> wrestling with the beastly uh, harmonium, uh, as they called it, of Talk Age. So um, yeah, it was machine gun, it was blown up in the air, it was gassed several times, and he always, you know, uh, put it back together again, as we still do today, you know, where you can clearly see some of the keys uh, at the back, you know, it's basically cork, so it, yeah, one, one a year breaks, but we, not a lot, but we keep using it, if, you, if someone can visit and can play, we invite them to play, it's used in mass and services, uh, because that's what Tubby wanted to, you know, and uh, until it falls to pieces, we are going to play it. Uh, Extraordinary. Yes, yes. And you mentioned that a shell came in and smashed the attic. Yes. Is there, is there any sign of where, yeah. that, uh, where that occurred? I'll show you. You can clearly see there's a line here in the floorboards. Ah, yes. Where the floorboards look differently. And uh, outside as well, uh, you can see the masonry work is, is cut up suddenly because uh, beneath our feet right here is 5.9 room. Uh, the size of the shell that came through, basically. So this corner was blown away. And despite all that, Toby said, no, no, let's, let's you know, have an attic up and let, let's have a uh, congregation up here. Uh, there are testimonials of uh, Poppering and being targeted by the long range guns, you know, that would blow whole train sets away. And they would hear them entering the town at the Ring Road, Market Square, and there's a congregation here, and uh, there's two occasions. One is they're all singing a hymn. Toby's Batman comes and starts, wait, shut up, come. They wouldn't budge, eh? We are going to finish the hymn. We'd rather get blown up here, singing, than you know, on the staircase leading. So they, they continued. And another case, even more powerful, it's absolutely quiet. They're all praying. And they hear the shells coming. And no one moves. And the next one falls you know, on the other side of the town and went right over their heads and they, they just continued praying. They'd rather, if anything happened, rather die here than on the run, you know, or, or you know, it, it meant a lot to them. They felt safe in this place, uh, bizarrely or, or not, you know, they, they had faith uh, and that carried a lot of the men through, you know. It's hard to imagine sometimes these days, but uh, religion and faith was something that they grabbed on, you know, hung, clung on, you know, whilst everything else fell to pieces. How do you uh, feel when you come into this room, Simon? I'm not religious at all, but this place speaks to me, you know. Uh, it has a religion of its own. Uh, so, um, we still use it today. We have weddings here, you know. Uh, you should have imagined, Matt, you would have loved to see that. Uh, two of our volunteers, two men, in very big tall hats, you know, <laughs> with a lot of banter, got married here. <laughs> And, and I'm, even Tommy would have been shocked to see the sight of all of it, <laughs> but it is every man's club, you know, and we, we, it lives and breathes that still today. So, uh, and some of people with military affiliations asked to get married. Anyone can, you know, it's open for that. Uh, we use it, that's the main thing, you know. Uh, and uh, I'm always very touched when we can. So we, there's one other artifact, if I may. Please. I, I'll show you. Um, so Tubby said after the war, we need a symbol that unites us, that carries, you know, that we, that we can take with us. So they, they needed something catchy. Uh, and so they said, we'll take a lamp. It's, it looks very interesting, you know, to say the least. People wonder always what is the, the link with it. Uh, it makes you curious. So they added the cross of Lorraine, the coat of arms of Eber, where their friends are killed. And then the light, the light of friendship. What we, what we use the lamp for today is still to remember people. And actually, uh, yesterday the news reached us of one of our uh, members, one of our wardens, 15 years, he's been a volunteer in the house and he passed away. And uh, it's the first time I'm back up here, so I'll light the lamp and we do that in his memory. So. so his name was uh, John Denny and he, 
helped a lot with you know finances and and wardening and he did a lot a lot of stuff as a volunteer he was due to come back next year for two weeks uh, with his wife sue so uh, this is how you know this is our last post if you like our exhortation our way of remembering someone <laughs>